uh, your worship we should be ready to go now thank you sir all right ladies and gentlemen i'd like to bring this meeting of orangeville town council to order this is monday june the 7th at uh, seven o'clock earlier this evening uh, town council did have a closed meeting during that meeting we did approve the agenda um, and i did disclose um, an issue of, of direct pecuniary interest to council um, tonight my uh, son spencer is going to be presenting so I'll be stepping away from the meeting while that presentation is ongoing. Uh, I wanna read a few uh, items here. Notice, uh, due to efforts to contain the spread of COVID-19 and to protect all individuals, the council chambers at town hall will not be open to the public to attend council meetings until for further notice. Members of the public who have an interest in a matter listed on the agenda may up until 10 a.m. on the day of the scheduled council meeting Email council agenda at orangeville.ca indicating your request to speak to a matter listed on the agenda. A phone number and conference ID code will be provided to you so that you may join the virtual meeting and provide your con comments to council. Members of the public wishing to raise a question during the public question period of the council meeting may beginning at 7 p.m. on the evening of the council or public meeting call 1-289-801-5774 and enter conference ID 734-670-26 pound sign. Correspondence and email submitted will be considered as public information and entered into the public record. If you require access to information in an alternate format, please contact the clerk's division by phone at 519-941-0440, extension 2256, or via email at clerksdepartment at orangeville.ca. We would also like to acknowledge the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe people, including the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Odawa of the Three Fires Confederacy. This meeting is being aired on public television and our stream live and may be taped for later public broadcast or webcast. Your name is part of the public record and will be included in the minutes of this meeting. Mr. Bonanno, can we have the singing of our national anthem, please? Oh, Canada, a home and native land, true patriot love in all of us command. With glowing hearts we see thee rise, the true north strong and free. From far and wide, O oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. God, keep our land glorious and free. O oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. stand on guard for thee. Thank you to David Nair, the Artistic Director of Theatre Orangeville for that rendition of our national anthem. Moving on to item number eight, uh, we have a public information center. Well, this is uh, an exciting development for uh, our downtown uh, area. I believe it was in uh, early 2020, we uh, voted to approve a budget to uh, refurbish the sidewalks and the streetscape in downtown Orangeville. And uh, tonight, uh, this will be a public information center for town staff to reward, provide more information and to allow residents to ask questions. Uh, Mr. Lackey, I'll turn it over to you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, Good evening and uh, good evening council. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great, thank you. Uh, I would also like to extend a welcome to those attending or listening uh, to this, the Broadway Brick Replacement Project Public Information Center. Tonight's meeting is actually our second PIC meeting. Our first meeting was held on May 12th. And again, tonight we look forward to seeking input and uh, comments from the various stakeholders and the general public on the Broadway Brick project. 
Uh, the Broadway brick replacement project focuses on the replacement of the existing concrete sidewalk and boulevard paving bricks. The, the limits of the projects are from the intersection of Wellington Street and 3rd Street in the east and westerly to John Street and Broadway at the west. The current paving bricks and concrete sidewalks were constructed in 1991. At that time, Broadway um, underwent a complete facelift, a full reconstruction, and that's 30 years ago. The bricks and the sidewalk are exhibiting excessive wear and increased maintenance costs. As mentioned, we held a public information meeting on May 12th. Staff have recorded the input from that meeting and will likewise record all comments from this evening's meeting. Others unable to attend this evening's meeting, and we know that there are some who have sent in comments and we appreciate that and thank them. Uh, and we wish to assure those and any other individuals who would like to send in comments uh, that these will be um, considered in preparing final recommendations for the project. As a recap, comments can be sent directly to staff or through the town's capital project dashboard webpage. And this is made available by going to the town of Orangeville's webpage and clicking on town hall and then capital projects. Tonight we have our engineering consultants with us, Triton Engineering Services Limited, Mr. Howard Ray and Taylor Cramp. And Triton Engineering will be giving a brief presentation on their findings and the condition of the existing sidewalk and paver stones. Based on their investigative work, the public input received to date and tonight, Infrastructure Services will prepare a final staff report and recommendations for advancing the project through to the construction stage. That report will be presented to Council at the end of this month, Monday, June 28. With that, I would invite engineering or Triton Engineering and Howard and Taylor to give their presentation on the Broadway bricks, and they are available to answer any questions um, at the end of their presentation. Thank you very much. Howard. Thank you, John. Um, can everyone hear me all right? Yes. Good. OK, and um, also, Taylor, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to work this out. If Taylor can share a screen and uh, so bring up the pictures and presentation materials. Since I'm old enough, I can't walk and chew gum at the same time. So, uh, so I'll just try to summarize the report that was in the package and maybe uh, can we go to the pictures first? Taylor, picture photo one. As John pointed out, um, can we make it Broadway larger, was... please? Can we make the screen larger, please? There we go. Thank you. Yeah, so Broadway was last uh, reconstructed the sidewalks in '91, and at that time, the uh, surface was predominantly paving stone. There was a narrow concrete sidewalk. I say narrow, four to five feet wide, uh, with um, paving stone bands in it, and although it you know, in 30 years, things have held up reasonably well. Uh, there is differential movement. Um, and one thing that we really wanted to focus on with the replacement was uh, improving accessibility, uh, smoother surface. So features like that small paving stone band that were done for aesthetic purposes, unfortunately, make the sidewalk uneven. And it's the type of thing we're trying to avoid. But we're still looking at replacing with a mixture of concrete and newer uh, more modern paving stone materials. But some of the, uh, so the differential movement's been a problem. Um, the trees, and you can see one in the picture there as well. The trees were all planted in 1991. They've done reasonably well, but this is an example of one that the roots have heaved substantially. And so there's a problem, a trip hazard the trees, these particular trees have essentially gotten too big for the boulevard, but that doesn't affect all the trees. There seems to be a mix, although they were all the same size when planted. 
Um, some of them are showing heaving, other locations, uh, there aren't any uh, issues to date. So I think um, just move through quickly the rest of the photos that were, if you can pull back out a bit. Uh, Taylor, so that's an example of the curb stop or water shut off that in the paving stone is, is creating a uh, trip hazard. Again, another example of a tree that, that has heaved badly. Again, this does not apply to all of them, but this is a particularly uh, poor one and Public Works has had to replace the existing grates with some, with some stone in this area. Um, but conversely, this is the original uh, concrete tree grate that was put in and although there was a metal insert to protect the tree trunk until it got larger, this particular installation is still level and um, the trees have been assessed, the majority are actually still in good health. Um, and this is one that we're not at this point seeing any uh, heaving problems in the side. Uh, we do have issues with these are um, junction boxes that are associated with the traffic signals that are where the wiring collects into. Uh, when they're set in the paving stone, such as the paving stone comes out to the uh, intersection, there's differential movement and again, trip hazards are a problem. Just an area in front of Town Hall where particularly the paving stone has uh, developed quite a bit of um, heaving and wheat wave to it and is not an acceptable uh, pedestrian surface any longer. And when the street was first built, uh, there were parking meters, the parking meter posts have now, some of them been converted to a, a bike rack, although the location isn't ideal for a bike rack. Uh, these are generally unsightly and will be removed as part of the project and um, locations will be looked for to provide concrete pads for, for newer bike racks. And uh, this is one area that we're taking a closer look at where there's steps in the um, right of way that are now uh, are not accessible and we'll be speaking to or deal working with the property owner to see if we can do a, a, an extended ramp here to provide improve accessibility and also the steps are represent a hazard uh, to, for the town to maintain uh, in the um, in the right of way. Uh, Touch briefly on accessibility. Certainly, since this project was built, the uh, Accessibility for Ontarians Act, which I think we're all familiar with, AODA has been brought in. Uh, we'll ensure that this project brought up to standard. Those standards include things like maximum slope, so that the sidewalks are not too steep. And importantly, wherever sidewalks meet um, intersections and crosswalks, there's now a requirement for the tactile plates, uh, which you've seen going around uh, various locations. Those are to uh, let the visually impaired be aware that they're entering a traffic area. Uh, the town had started a practice a number of years ago of painting the uh, curbs yellow. So what we intend to do is to put, extend the concrete sidewalk out to the curb in order to install these tactile plates and put in the yellow colored tactile plates and then the color, the painting of the curbs can be uh, discontinued. Uh, I touched briefly uh, on the boulevard trees um, again and since the reports, you know, we provided a number of options and one of the concerns is that, you know, we can't be certain if we leave some of the trees in that you know, 30 years from now that we won't have heaving problems with the ones that aren't currently heaving, but we've certainly had feedback that trees are still an important part of the streetscape downtown. Uh, we've gone through, at this point, we've assessed uh, 12 trees where we feel the heaving is severe enough that they would have to be removed or replaced under the project. The others, 
we feel we can uh, clean the tops, do a bit of vacuum cleaning, and probably go with sort of a small open pit around the tree now that the tree is big enough to basically stand on its own. But uh, options remain. We're still looking for input uh, on the best way to deal with the uh, boulevard trees on the project. But I think in consultation with Public Works and with um, Allison at the BIA, uh, we're leaning towards retaining the ones that we can retain. Uh, some other things that really weren't part of the original scope of the project, but that will take steps to accommodate as they're important to the downtown is the waste receptacles. There's a variety of different styles, the sort of round concrete ones that were put in with the project originally are they're not the they're not that practical. They're not the best looking. They're not good with emptying. Some of the ones now that are the uh, multi stream, we'd be looking for something of that type um, and locating them at uh, suitable locations. Uh, again, a number of these items that were not part of the actual sidewalk replacement will accommodate, such as uh, locations for benches, accommodate the existing sculptures on the streets. Uh, the light standards, as you can see in the photo on the screen, or do another coat of paint, and that will be done as part of the uh, project. Uh, another topic that uh, the BIA had brought up and that we discussed with uh, Allison Shield is more opportunities for electrical uh, servicing at some of the corners for events. Uh, when the there are ducts in place for the street lights now. When that was done in 91, we did install some spare ducts. So we believe there's an opportunity to utilize those spare ducts and um, provide power pedestals at, at key locations. So that's something that uh, we were in consultation with Public Works, we were able to adjust the scope somewhat to make sure that we took this opportunity to be able to um, make sure that there's a, an ability to install those type of pedestals at some key locations uh, that we've reviewed with the BIA. So I'd like to move to the overall concept and if we can go to the colored plans, Taylor. Uh, and there'll be a couple of di uh, revisions that will be a, um, implemented on this, but this is to give a concept. And let's uh, let's scroll down to say what maybe the first street intersection, the next page. So as we had pointed out before, right now the concrete only extends uh, four to five feet from the front of the buildings. What we really wanted to focus on was a wider area where uh, groups of people can can walk and and you know although all the paving stone boulevards are also walkable we wanted to really focus on a clear approximately 2.2 or um, eight meter wide pathway out from the stores that would extend out to the intersections with the tactile plates which we're showing here uh, in the yellow bands uh, for accessibility reasons and also to ensure that we're providing a smooth surface. Some other changes are the trowel joints that used to be put in every five feet on a sidewalk. Now we do require an expansion joint every 20 feet, but the others will be saw cut, so there'll be a much more level joint and easier uh, for wheelchairs and other uh, wheeled appliances to uh, pass over. Mm -hmm. And so in conjunction with that, then was replacement of the boulevard, um, paving stones, which we've indicated with the hatch. Uh, again, there are sort of styles of newer, larger size stone, so it's going to be a similar concept to what's out there, but the paving stone area a little smaller and really focusing in the boulevard area where we also have the trees, the light standards, uh, benches and other sort of appurtenances. But these boulevard areas are also very important. Uh, they can be used, you know, with for the patios and, um, and other factors and getting a new material, a new level material in there will be beneficial, not only to those walking, but also to stores that are utilizing the uh, sidewalk area at times. Uh, 
I think that was the over, overview of what we're looking at in terms of the replacement project. I'll touch briefly on um, overall construction scheduling because I know that's certainly very important to everybody. Um, at this time, uh, we're looking at uh, if we if council approves the project at the end of June, we'd go to tender in early July, closing in August and um, starting after Labor Day. So to try to picture how the project will be done, it will not be all done at once. It's going to be done on a rolling basis, uh, block by block. And if you can sort of picture breaking the street into um, sort of four sections per side, so it would be John to first, first to Mill, Mill to second, and then Mill to uh, to Wellington. So that's four different segments, and then the two sides of the road um, would make for eight what I'm going to call blocks for the purposes of this discussion. So at any given time, you know, we'd start say at one end on one side. Uh, removals within the first block and preparation would take approximately a week. The second week would be pouring the concrete and starting on the paving stones and likely into a third week to complete the paving stone work, which is a little slower. But by the time the new concrete is poured, full access to the uh, stores will be uh, reset. And then as one block, we'd start one week in the one block and then when it's in the pouring stage, the second block next to it would be in the removal stage. So because if we waited till each block was completely finished, it would stretch the length out. So by the rolling closures, we're maximizing the productivity, but still limiting the amount of uh, street that's under construction. But in front of any one given business, we'd anticipate that construction period to be approximately three weeks and we feel they can probably do better than that but we're being uh, conservative from a planning perspective uh, so john is there anything that i missed that you wanted me to highlight for the group before we take questions no i think that's fine Howard. um I'm I'm good with what you presented. I didn't know whether you were going to talk about the uh, the tech pavers. Well, yeah, um, I guess at the very end of the addendum, we had some samples of paver types. I can find it. Correct. Yeah. So the, the trend now is more to a, a larger stone, a little more modern look. Um, uh, there's also sort of a tend towards grays, but in discussion, we've sort of felt that, you know, we'd still like to pick up some of that terracotta color that uh, is in the existing um, intersections and the medians. But there's a, a wide variety, but this is a sort of sort of larger stone, uh, cleaner look that we're looking at for the boulevard areas. Yeah, and there are some more samples. Very good. All right, Mr. Ray, uh, Mr. Cramp, thank you for your presentation. Um, I, uh, I would like to call on councillors if you have any questions of uh, Mr. Ray, Mr. Lackey. Um, Deputy Mayor McIntosh, and I'm wondering if, if you could remove this from the screen so I can see everybody now, um, Mr. Cramp. Very good, thank you, sir. All right, Deputy Mayor McIntosh, go ahead, sir. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, thank you, Howard. That was a very good um, presentation. Uh, you had mentioned that it was starting roughly after Labor Day. Now, with these rolling stops that you talk of, talk of when do you anticipate this project being completed? Uh, we'll be looking at uh, mid-November. But the other thing is, because we're only going to let them start a block and we'll know the time that they're able to do, if it's getting um 
too late. And so we certainly don't want to go past mid-November and possibly even early November for two reasons. One, strictly from an engineering point of view for curing the concrete, we don't want cold weather. And secondly, we recognize that it's starting to get into Christmas season, but we do it would have the opportunity that we would monitor and wouldn't let the contractor start a block um, without knowing when you would finish. And so potentially then, you know, maybe there's one block or two that, that didn't get finished. Our preference would be to, to shut that down and finish up if it did mean finishing up two or three weeks in the spring of next year. Okay, as you know, there's I guess there's a lot of concerns about businesses wanting to stay open and stuff like that. So if if it was to be put off to early next year, how would that affect things? Uh, one of the concerns, and I think, I don't know, John, we sort of ran through, uh, obviously we have another winter of maintaining the existing surface. Um, one thing uh, is if the Orange, if the Jazz and Blues Festival is back on its date of early June, we'd be very concerned that we don't want to have things in a bad condition for the festival, and that's one of the risks of starting it in the spring. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Um, yeah, Councillor Andrews, go ahead. Thank you very much, Your Worship, and uh, thank you, uh, gentlemen, for your presentation. The report itself was uh, quite thorough, and uh, I do uh, thank you for the, the detail that was in that report. Uh, a couple of questions, and, and one that's piggybacked on the Deputy Mayor's point um, about, uh, of course, the timeline, and I appreciate the uh, disclosure on the proposed timeline. I know that uh, many businesses are concerned, uh, especially during these times, as uh, we've gone through quite an extensive impedance of a business opening or lack thereof. And now with the opportunity with the province uh, saying as of this Friday, there will be the opportunity for some to kind of somewhat open their doors. But I know that there's been an expression of concern as for the timeline. So I just wanted to express that. Um, as for uh, an observation, um, and again, I don't profess to be an expert at all when it comes to sidewalk replacement, but you know, how would something like that be done, especially with the, um, you know, Broadway, of course, and then first, uh, you know, does the concrete, concrete truck come in and, you know, excavation takes place? Would that impede some of the traffic and the ability for the traffic to thoroughly go eastbound or westbound when those sides are, are being um, uh, replaced? Yes, what we would make use of, and it, it does would also have an impact, is that the contractor will need some staging areas, and so that will they would use the parking lanes. So that, again, being fully open here, it does mean that while we're working on the sidewalk in front of those particular blocks, that the parking would not be available. The parking lane would need to be used for construction, but that would allow the uh, through the traffic to continue to flow on the street. And in terms of the sidewalk replacement itself, we work very closely with the business owners, giving them notice of of when the concrete's actually being pulled up. When it's being when it's being poured is the the trickiest time, but we would provide temporary ramps. And uh, we have we were through all this in '91, where not only did we redo all the sidewalks, but all the sewers and services, and it was uh, so really even a much bigger scope back then, but we did keep all the businesses open and um, activity active at the time. But it, uh, without a question, there's some disruptions. Uh, we're not digging holes this time, which is helpful, just removing five inches of concrete and replacing it so it's a little easier to manage. But uh, nevertheless, obviously, we'll, you know, we'd have temporary routes to direct uh, uh, pedestrians to uh, some temporary ramps into stores and um, as I mentioned before they will have to make use of the parking lane in the active construction area uh, for trucks and construction materials. Okay thank you for that. Uh, your Worship I have one more question. Go ahead sir. That's okay. Thank you. Um, as uh, the pandemic has enabled people to become a little more active outside walking and biking uh, I noticed that of course the um, the bike locks, uh, which were the former parking meters, um, you know, their proximity to the um, edge of the the curb and close to where vehicles would park, 
uh, you know, going through your extensive report, I ended up reviewing a lot of the, the furniture that was being talked about proposed. Um, I may have missed it, but uh, and I apologize. But uh, as for bicycle racks, uh, any suggestions uh, on where these could be? Because again, the luxury of where those current bike racks are is in many cases, they are just outside certain business locations. And not to say people don't mind walking after they've been on their bike, but uh, the closer to a, a you know, particular business might be advantageous. So I'd just like to hear your comment to that, please. Yeah, some of these uh, specifics um, did sort of come up, you know, once we got our head into the project and realized there were some things that needed looking at. So that's something we'd be looking for input uh, and conversation with the BIA on specific locations. We can provide um, concrete pads um, really anywhere that's convenient. Certainly some things that are, uh, we want to, you know, the obviously where the where it is now next to the curb is not, as you say, the right location, and that's simply because it was converted from an old parking meter. But we also want to make sure that we're keeping that 2.2 meters of clear walkway in front of the buildings. And uh, some of the bulbs are, provide opportunity for street uh, furniture, but we've also had input from the BIA that those are very important areas where um, things can be set up for uh, displays and um, and, and events. So uh, yes, you're right, it's a little bit of a challenge finding the right place for bike racks, but we certainly will work with the community to find those best locations and what uh, suits everyone best. Thank you. All right, uh, Councillor Peters. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Three, you've got a couple of questions. Um, start with potentially some of the easier ones. Um, there's discussion about the old water fountains and, and the water service that runs there. Obviously, that's sort of a, an outdated feature in a streetscape. Um, but I wonder about bottle refilling stations and if you've had any experience uh, with some of those opportunities where the water already exists, turning them into uh, more of a public feature uh, from that perspective. Uh, Your Worship, I don't personally have experience with that, but uh, as uh, Councillor Peters points out, those water services are there. So um, at first blush, if that was a feature that wanted to be looked into, it is something that uh, could possibly readily be done without excavation. Um, Councillor Peters, I, you know, at, at, it was either FCM or AMO back when things were open a couple of years ago, I did see a combined water filling station, water fountain and dog watering station. And uh, I thought, you know, interesting. And we certainly could uh, stand a couple of those on Broadway. So I'm, I'm fully supportive of what you're saying. Go ahead, right. sir, you have other questions? Uh, yeah, two more if you don't mind. Uh, the next one was with respect to the uh, impressed concrete versus the pavers. Um, you mentioned that it's uh, slightly more, it's where you have maintenance issues uh, and slipperiness with respect to uh, the, the stamped concrete. Uh, instead of pavers, you didn't cover that option in your presentation. Just wondering if you could elaborate. Yes, and um, to some degree too, I guess it's a matter of uh, of preference, but uh, we sometimes have found that the water seems, you know, can collect in the little impressed grooves a little bit. And uh, part of it too is whenever I've seen impressed concrete, just to my eye, it looks, um, a bit fake to use, I'm not sure. It, it seems like it gets a very mono color. And then one problem with it is that when it has been out there, it starts to disc, uh, the color changes. And if you do have to do a repair in the future, it's next to impossible to match the color or the concrete color to match what was there before. But uh, to me, I feel that the pavers, they're, they're constructed in a, a more controlled environment. Um, you know, there's certainly a lot of choice in, of color in them and they're durable. And to me, they're able to get a little range of color in them. And I, to me, it's a more natural looking product than what uh, colored concrete is to my eye. Right, perhaps as a follow up to Mr. Lackey, um, will the cost differences be explored in the staff report? Or at this point, is there only sort of one direction uh, for that calculation? 
through uh, chairman to uh, Councilor Peters. Yes, we'll we'll be providing some cost estimates for comparison purposes. Yes, and I believe that the impressed concrete is a a higher cost product. So we will we will provide that for you. Okay, thanks. And Mr. Mayor, do you mind one more? Sure. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and this is the big one for me, and I'm sure everyone saw it coming. But it's uh, about the trees. And uh, I was surprised to find that the report didn't have an option C, which was to find engineering solutions to keep all the trees and, and perhaps even infill where some of the early trees have been removed. Um, to me, this is the opportunity to to find a way to improve that aspect of the downtown. And you know, when I look at other downtowns that, that I admire and a lot of them have a lot of great history and aesthetics, but you know, the ones with trees and shade uh, and that natural element, you know, certainly set us apart. Uh, even from other striking downtowns in Southern Ontario. So, you know, I, I'd really be interested in, um, like I said, being a little more creative and seeing where even some of those that have started to heave, um, if they can be solved with uh, different uh, great arrangements or curbs or, you know, and we'll have to weigh, you know, the balance of factors there in terms of uh, winter maintenance and that sort of thing. But uh, I guess I was hoping uh, there would be an option in the report uh, that looked at the, you know, the maximum retention and, and addition of those trees. So uh, we obviously don't have that answer at the moment, but um, certainly if that can be explored between now and, and the staff report, I'd very much appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Council Peters. And uh, I know you, you touched upon costs there. I'm, you know, the talk of, of delaying here, construction costs are galloping right now. Uh, not And, and you know, any, any delay is likely going to be uh, we're going to be faced with some sort of cost increase if it's going into next year. Um, in terms of accessibility, Mr. Ray, you know, I, I remember I, I did a survey one one day. Um, I think something like 60 to 70 percent of businesses on Broadway, you have to step up to get into them. It's certainly an impediment to wheelchair accessibility and to anybody with mobility issues. You know, is there any way that you can raise that sidewalk and to try and minimize the number of step ups into um, into businesses? And have how much time has been spent on that particular issue? You did touch upon it earlier tonight, but I'm just wondering, are we going to be able to resolve any of these issues? Hi, Your Worship. Uh, it's certainly a challenging problem with the construction and uh, one of the problems with it is, is the way, you know, the way those were were built back in, in the in the day. So there's sort of two issues and one is if we bring the sidewalk up to the sort of top of step, the sidewalk is actually literally higher than the floor of the um, building, which doesn't meet code and creates a problem with water, perhaps getting back into the floor. And also one, you know, although when we did do the project in 91, we were able to get rid of a few, especially the sort of little smaller lips at this point, because the, the curves aren't being changed. If we were to raise the sidewalk six inches to match a step at the store, we would now have an excessive slope from the um, from that elevation out to the curb, which exceeds the 5% allowed by the AODA. So it's uh, the construction of the buildings themselves and, and other constraints make it very, very challenging, unfortunately. Well, I, I was wondering about that, but of course we, we've got, you know, certain businesses like the Royal Bank and, and TD Bank, and I think even our library has uh, been able to uh, navigate those issues. So um, anyway, um, I'm hopeful that we can uh, correct some of those uh, in, in this, you know, construction that we're doing now. Uh, councillors, any, uh, any further comments? or questions. Councillor Sherwood, then Councillor Taylor. Uh, yes, Your Worship, um, through you uh, to staff. I just wanted to uh, kind of piggyback on what Councillor Peters was talking about with the trees and uh, also uh, Councillor Andrews with the, uh, the bike racks. Those are very important. But going back to the trees, if we go back to the original project in 1991, there was a total of 94 trees. And I understand back in 91, um, okay, maybe it's not 91. I'm, 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 I forget where I'm missing it. I, at some point, um, I believe 
was it 10 of the those trees got removed and never replaced mr lackey that is correct uh councillor sherwick yes there are there have been a number of trees that have been removed over the years that have not been replaced so um getting back to um my my thought process i'd like us to see us get back to the 94 trees i mean if we want to stay within our tree canopy we can't keep removing trees and not replacing them um so i i really think that that's very very important uh, that we save these trees as much as we can and get back to where we originally were back in in uh, 1991. um um and what okay that's that's it for now <laughs> thank you all right thanks councillor sherwood um councillor taylor yes thank you your worship. Uh, thank you your worship uh, i'd like to talk to you four things quickly one is i am a hugger not of councillor peters but of trees as well and uh i i think it's it beautifies our downtown i i do absolutely love them and when you are sitting out on that sidewalk and looking down at it in the spring summer fall and you see those trees it, it just adds to our downtown and uh, i think kingston is universally known as one of the best downtowns in in uh, ontario anyway uh, orangeville is up there on that list uh, with our tree canopy so i'd love to be able to find a way to keep those number two is uh, just talking through things that are issues the mocha berry in front of the mocha berry is uh hazardous uh, the pictures that were given tonight show some of it and uh, you know it's true the bricks have heaved uh, it's certainly a place that I like to frequent and uh, it's it's difficult and if you're a senior and potentially could to, could trip I mean we're leaving ourselves open for liability so there's no there's no doubt in my mind that this needs to be done I love the pictures that have been provided uh, that modern look it's certainly different than what we have now I think the beautification that this is going to do for our downtown is is going to be tremendous but that said I'd like to address the timing of it and the timing of now concerns me greatly so first off, I'll, I'll go forward to next June. Next June is Blues and Jazz Festival, probably one of the most, I was gonna say the most, and then I realize I'll be insulting, but top three most important events that this town puts on is the Blues and Jazz Festival. We cannot interrupt that Blues and Jazz Festival. We need to make sure that we're providing a way to make sure that they have that, um, that event. So I'm wondering if there's a way to maneuver around that with construction or even talk to the organizers now and potentially talk about, is there any flexibility in dates and moving those dates back to accommodate what I would suggest should probably be a spring project. And that's my last comment. And that is the businesses that are downtown now need the income. They need the monies that needs to be generated um, and to, to disrupt that, although the work needs to be done and I think the project is wonderful, it's not a matter of should it or shouldn't, it should be done. It's just a matter of timing. I don't think this is the right time. I think we're gonna put undue strain on businesses that are already strained and our downtown is vibrant. It's interesting, it's got wonderful businesses and we just can't jeopardize that right now. So although I'm not necessarily cautious when it comes to investment, I think that this time deserves caution. And I think if at all possible, we should delay uh, to next spring. Thank you. Councillor Post. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, I want to piggyback a little bit off what Councillor Taylor just said as my first comment, and I would ask through you maybe to Mr. Lackey on that. Um, I have concerns about the timing as well um, for our businesses, but I also have concerns about the timing of this project from an accessibility standpoint. And as chair of the Joint Accessibility Committee, We've had several complaints and concerns about, <coughs> excuse me, um, trip hazards in the downtown core and people who are afraid to navigate downtown for fear of falling and injuring themselves on some of the areas that are already heaving. So through you, perhaps Mr. Mayor to Mr. Lackey, if there is a desire to delay this project um, from fall until next spring, how can we address the issues of accessibility that exist right now with some of the trip hazards um, in a way to, to to prevent, I guess, any of the trip and falls that could happen at this point, because that's probably my biggest concern with delaying the project. And I'm completely understanding what Councillor Taylor is saying about the businesses. I think that's a very important piece, but there are people who are already not going downtown to visit our businesses for fear of, of tripping and hurting themselves. Mr. Lackey. Uh, through your worship uh, to Councillor Post, um, 
Uh, we appreciate all these comments. These are, are great suggestions about the timing and uh, I will speak uh, to that. There is also the possibility of delaying this till 2022 in the fall. We have sort of internally discussed that. Um, and again, I go back to, to saying we appreciate all these, these comments uh, about this so that we have to take these all away and digest them. In, in regards to um, the trip hazards, we do have a program each year and we look at that and it's about this time right now that we, we spend a few dollars and we go through the downtown core and we repair those trip hazards. So in, in terms of accessibility, we are addressing those as best we can each spring. Perfect. Mr. Mayor, if I may continue, thank you for that answer, Mr. Lockie. I'm glad to hear that because I was worried that those maybe wouldn't be addressed with the idea that this project was going to be coming in the in this in the fall. So um, when it comes to the trees, I agree completely with what Councillor Peters has said. I would love to see us in um, adding more trees to the downtown core where there were already were some some that were taken down. Um, but with that said, I noticed in a lot of the photos that there is a lot of heaving around the trees. And with those paving stones through you to Mr. Ray, um, is there a different option of how we can take care of the area around those trees without putting paver stones that could heave? Um, could it be left to be more soil or perhaps a gardenscape around it in some way that would still be able to be maintained through public works, but would not cause the heaving in the in the long term. Yeah, your worship. Uh, yes, we looked at that and took a look at places. Um, took a walk on Spadina in Toronto and looks like they had trees there that outgrew their grates and now they just essentially have have open earth that's level with the sidewalk. It doesn't appear to me to be any sort of a uh, hazard or, or maintenance problem. So that's where I'm leaning right now rather than some type of an expensive grade is uh, just, you know, the trees that, that haven't heaved too much uh, is just leave them in an open, uh, when I, an open is a little, maybe it doesn't come across right because it sounds like it would be a drop, but it's not. It would be level with the sidewalk, but, but earth or mulch uh, that allows the uh, tree to get water. The trees now, the, the one advantage is that they've they've certainly reached the size where uh, they can kind of stand on their own such as it, as it is and they don't need um, brackets to protect them, you know, from from the plows and so on. So they've, they've done pretty well actually. And the one thing that we would do and it, uh, we'd get a, a, a vac truck and actually in some cases it's a bit hard to tell looking at them whether it's actually the roots that have pushed up that high or whether the roots are pushing soil and other material up, but we could clean that uh, with a dry vac truck that wouldn't damage the roots. It might mean that we'd almost have to make the decision as we're doing each one, but if it turns out that the roots are actually down lower and we can just simply replace that material, we may be able to retain them where the ones that the roots have actually broken the surface of the sidewalk, uh, would unfortunately have to be uh, removed or replaced. Thank you very much for those comments. I appreciate it. Deputy Mayor McIntosh. Thank you, Worship. Uh, through you to Councillor Sherwood. Um, has the BAA uh, had any thoughts on delaying it? Are they wishing that as well? I'm just curious the BIA's thoughts on this. I. Uh, Yes, uh, at our last uh, meeting, there was um, mixed emotions from from board members, but um, of course, uh, you'll have to hear uh, you'll hear some delegation tonight that will give some opinions from specific uh, businesses. I think uh, ideally, this isn't to their in their opinion the right time, uh, but the spring is also a concern as well. So I can see us leaning more towards fall of 2022. Thank you. All right. OK, councillors, um, I guess that uh, wraps up our questions and comments for Mr. Uh, Ray's presentation. Thank you, Mr. Ray and Mr. Cramp and uh, Mr. Lackey. Um, we will uh, we'll move on in our agenda. So uh, our next guest uh, is uh, Shelley Wishard. Uh, Ms. Wishard, uh, over to you. Hi. 
<laughs> um, you guys can see me. I've been kind of waiting here in the wings and sweating like crazy. Um, and it was really interesting. So thank you for allowing me to attend uh, this meeting tonight. And I have a presentation um, that I presented or that I um, put together. And I just got to, oh, here, okay. Um, sorry about this, guys. I'm trying to find my desktop. Um, oh no. Hmm. Okay. So I'm sorry. I don't know how to get this a little smaller. I'm just going to minimize a little bit and see if I can find it. I'm trying to get to my desktop. Um, and I had a spectacular presentation here. Oh, here it is. Hold on. Um, but that's the window desktop here. Oh, here we go. Um, there it is. So I don't know if you can hear me talking. I imagine you can. Um, yes, what you're seeing here are um, some of the businesses that you all know very well from Broadway. Um, and I'll just let them kind of load up here. These are, um, I also love trees. We all do here at Go Yoga. But what we love, I think probably more than the trees are the businesses that we consider to be the lifeblood of, um, of the whole vibrant community that we have in downtown Orangeville. So all of these businesses have signed a petition uh, requesting that council vote to delay the um, construction of the boulevard until next year. And um, the reason is probably obvious given the conversation that, um, that we've all had here. And that is really that we really could use a break um, at a time when we're just now starting to open up um, we need kind of like a free runway to, to rebuild our businesses. We've been surviving mostly on hope um, of better times ahead. Um, many of us have been not even open for six, for, we've been open for like six weeks of the year um, and only partially so. And if you're a restaurant or a hair salon, um, it's, it's worse depending on where you fall on the spectrum. Many of these businesses rely on walk-in business and what we're concerned about is any hindrance from the consumer's, consumer's point of view of uh, to come downtown. Like we, the idea that there's traffic, the idea that the store might not be all that accessible, all of those things um, put a, a note of doubt in our customers' minds. And that's something that we want to avoid. We want to be able to really roll out the red carpet. And our concern is if we don't do that, that some of these businesses here are not going to make it. And that was my dramatic <laughs> not making it thing. <laughs> and just so that you know, um, it's like easier probably to read, but these are the businesses. There's 62 um, that we had sign um, our petition. Um, and in addition to that, there on this list, there are four property owners. As you can imagine, it's really hard right now um, connecting with the business owners. A lot of them haven't been in their place of business. And literally, this was us just walking around and hardly anyone that I spoke to was in agreement with the um, construction right away. All of us are excited about the idea of a, a shiny um, sidewalk that looks spectacular, that sort of complements the downtown um, business facades that we have. But just that the timing right now is not it's not advantageous to any of us. Um, so I have a couple of statistics and this might be a little bit boring, but um, the first one is that over half of the businesses in Canada have reported a revenue decrease compared to August of 2019. And that is um, all sizes of businesses. Um, it's worse probably for smaller businesses. And I can tell you in um, the case of Go Yoga, our, our um, revenue is about 50% of what it was in 2019, end of April. So, um, and the other um, statistic that I wanted to share with you is um, from the Canadian Federation of Independent Business. And um, 
when you start to Google how construction affects businesses, there's a lot of stuff on the internet about from the CFIB, and this is is just one that is talking about the, how much um, it's kind of like a given that any kind of construction is harmful to businesses. So they have articles on on um, their site that talks about how you mitigate mitigate the damage um, caused or the loss of revenue caused. So it's not like um, it, your business is is maybe going to be even. It's like what do you do when your business is down due to um, construction? And all of that is um, during regular times. And then this is another one that is from the CFIB. And really, the only thing I really wanted to point out here is that um, that a, a, a big percentage of businesses saw a 46% drop in sales due to construction. And that was without the already low level um, caused by the pandemic. Um, so what I'm asking um, and what we're asking collectively, but me on behalf of the other businesses that signed the petition is that council reconsider the timing. We very much like the idea of sprucing up our sidewalks, making it more accessible for people to walk, but we really think that the timing this year could cause um, us to lose some of, uh, of our businesses, the, the vibrant core of the downtown area, the reason that people come to downtown. So um, that's what we're asking you to do is to, to do the right thing and support your local businesses. And then just on here, I, I have the actual petition as well. What was the question asked there, uh, Ms. Wisher? Can you go back to page one? Um, yeah. I request that Orangeville Town Council postpone this project to another year to allow businesses on Broadway to recover from the restrictions imposed by the pandemic. That was it. This is the first petition I've ever done. So it might not be all that scientifically correct. I'm not really sure, but it was it really started with conversations with my neighbors and everybody was kind of um, aghast that this would even be something that is being considered. Ms. Wishard, were, were people notified that this was going to be a two to three week upset and that access to their stores was not going to be? Yes. Yeah, stopped? we talked about that. Um, I went to the first public information meeting too, and um, the concern is not so much the two to three weeks and people walking over a ramp. That I mean, that's not ideal. Of course it's not, but it's more the perception in, in the consumer's mind that, oh, I want to go downtown Broadway. I'm going to pick up something at Home. Oh, you know what? There's construction. I don't know where the construction is. You know what? I'm just going to order it online. Our, our customers overall and the consumer in general has had to drum, jump through so many hoops. Um, they've been really great. I would say people have gone out of their way. It's very almost fashionable now to support local, um, but there gets to be a point where enough is enough. And I think we just could all, not just the businesses, but also our consumers could use a break. Fair enough. Thank you, Ms. Wish. You're welcome. Counselors. Thank you for I, I see Councillor Andrews and Councillor Taylor. Uh, Councillor Andrews, go ahead. Uh, Councillor Taylor had his hand up yeah, before. I'm I... sorry. Councillor Taylor, go right ahead, sir. Very kind. Thank you, Councillor Andrews. Um, through you, Your Worship, to Ms. Wisher, I guess um, kind of a question statement for you, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. And that is uh, in the time that I've been on council, there's been a few, um, you know, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. And I think this is kind of one of these things. So again, I've been up front and shared that. I would like to see us delay it, but I can see a world next year, uh, even if it's next fall, where a lot of these same arguments are going to come forth. Um, and so just be great if if the business owners who are watching this tonight, who I'm sure are, that if council did align with me and we, we did delay, that we're going to upset the apple cart again next year. But at some point, the work has to get done and I will vote to have this done at some point. It needs to be done and I just just wanted to get your thoughts on that and and what the rest of the business owners would say to that as well. Everybody has said do it next year. Give us some time to recover. That's sort of the general um, sentiment about it. And of course, I know next year we'll, we'll all be like, no, one more year. Yeah. 
definitely. Yeah. And that's just, just the way it goes. But um, I think everybody has that runway um, to know, okay, this is actually going to be done next year. I think that the more that we talk about it, the better. It's hard, I think, for businesses, and I'm not making excuses for us, but it's hard to be tuned into what's happening on, on town council, what projects are happening, um, to sit in a four-hour meeting hoping that they're going to discuss the somewhere during that meeting the, the topic that matters so much to us. Yeah. Um, I think it's really helpful to communicate, let's say, with the, with the BIA on this and and if the BIA can be maybe instrumental in delivering that message to the businesses to say okay we've got a reprieve but this is definitely going to happen next year so that people know I, I don't think that they're unreasonable I just think that they're all just very tired and some, some retailers um, and some businesses along here aren't even paying themselves right now so I mean it's just people need a chance to recover yeah thank very you. good thank you Councillor Andrews Thank you very much, Your uh, Worship, and uh, Ms. Wishart, thank you for your articulate presentation, and uh, very similar to what Councillor Taylor, I think if I had gone first before he did, we probably would have shared, vir you know, virtual <laughs> same wording, but, uh, you know, as the chair of the Business Economic Development Advisory Committee, um, we've heard a number of these concerns of the businesses in the downtown core, and I think that uh, your leadership and the BIA's leadership is uh, certainly being heard. Um, I think that the ramp up is, is something that's very important and you know with the um, opportunities that uh, now have been announced by the province as of June 11th you know you need that time and, and uh, like Councillor Taylor I will uh, certainly be looking at a way of delaying this to next year but it is inevitable we do have you know some repairs that have to be done and, and the longer you wait the more expensive it will end up being so it is certainly something that uh, the downtown business uh, owners uh, and the downtown business residents will have to be prepared for but it has to be done at some point but uh, deferring it to 2022 would be uh, certainly ideal in my books thank you very good mr lackey if you could weigh in please um anticipated uh, cost uh, issues uh and just wondering about uh trip and fall accidents and are there many on broadway i mean i we're, we're not given any of these statistics or nor are we part of any insurance information but uh you know does the town have uh you know incidents uh along broadway and and if you could speak to maybe delaying one year um the, the cost uh, implications or if you can <laughs> it's pretty uh, yeah pretty unusual uh, situation right now yeah yeah thank you your worship um yes there are slip and falls on broadway uh, i am aware of a couple so that they do occur uh, as I mentioned earlier, we do attempt to deal with those trip hazards every spring by doing some repair. We don't get to them all, but we certainly uh, make an attempt to to repair as much as we can. In terms of costs, I, I think you highlighted this earlier yourself that uh, in this day and age with COVID, um, um, construction costs are escalating. Um, Howard may be able to speak to that a little more um, particular in um, specifics more so than I, but we have seen some construction costs that have increased. So delaying it a year will definitely be an increase, um, but um, I hear what the people are saying and construction is disruptive. Um, and I will uh, agree with what other people have said that uh, um, there's no good time for construction. It, uh, it is disruptive, but it has to be done. So All right. that's my comments, Mr. Mayor. All right, sir. Thank you. Councillor Peters. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, through you, I guess, to the group, uh, this, this one has been a struggle for me as well. I by no means have sort of come to a conclusion on the timing aspect, but one thing I would like to consider between now and when the report comes back, and, and this may be through Councillor Sherwood to the BIA uh, or through Mr. Osmond to the Economic Development Department, but you know, what have other towns done um, during construction processes to keep the businesses vibrant during those periods? Um, is there some sort of uh, outreach or some sort of uh, shouldering of the burden? Is, is there some way we can bridge that gap as a community, as a town, uh, as a BIA, um, you know, based on constructability and cost and, and getting the best solution implemented as quickly as possible, 
you know, this year would be great. Last year would have been great. Obviously, things didn't pan out that way. Um, you know, so I worry about going to next year for a variety of factors. And again, I just like I like the community to think about it and and see if we can't be creative and find a way to keep the businesses going during this period to make fall work um, for everybody. And you know, that may be you know some sort of uh, incentive program or, or marketing campaign or, or something but you know i think people are going to want to visit those businesses i know construction is a deterrent but we've all been at home long enough that if you told me i could go to broadway into my favorite store but i had to you know hop a curb a little bit or, or endure some dust i'm willing to do that and I, I bet you most of our town is as well so maybe between now and, and the meeting where we make a decision on the timing uh, we can see if some other towns have come up with some some great ways to keep the economics alive during what is hopefully a fairly short construction period. Right, and following up on that, Councillor Peters, I, I don't believe that this petition and the sample size is is complete. And, and I would like to reach out to the BIA to do a, a more comprehensive outreach to their membership. And uh, Councillor Sherwood, I don't know if that's possible, but you know, I. I just think this has come up really in the last week or 10 days. Um, I, I, I don't think the question asked is is uh, su has sufficient information for people to answer the question. And I don't believe everybody had had a complete uh, understanding of this is a two or three week uh, in interruption, not in their business, but in, in, the, uh, in, in the area. And I'd like to see a more full uh, uh, outreach by the BIA. Councillor Sherwood. Um, yes, Your Worship, I, I do want to let you know that the BIA has been very good at sending out multiple communications every week. They um, send out, uh, the ambassadors send out um, notifications, all things related to BIA. And this this reconstruction about the sidewalks has been on that topic on every weekly email that those members received. Um, I also want to let you know that this is also discussed at every month's board meeting. I encourage our BIA members to uh, come on and express their concerns to the BIA board members at, at those meetings. Nobody attends them, so I think this is your your opportunity to come on um, and ask uh, to be part of the the meetings. Um, we have them on the third Thursday of the month at 9 a.m and uh, the BIA can hook you up to zoom in, zoom in, but I can tell you there has been a lot of communication letting letting all the members know, uh, you know, dates and, and here's where you get information and here's the town's portal and link on this. So we have been communicating like crazy, I can assure you. Council Peters, I will take what you've um, suggested to the next board meeting. I think that's a very uh, good uh, good suggestion and I will uh, definitely bring that up with uh, our uh, members, uh, the board uh, meeting. Thank you. Very good. All right, councillors. Um, we've still got lots of agenda left here. Um, so uh, Ms. Wishard, I want to thank you very much for all the hard work that you've uh, done, obviously reaching out to, to this group. Um, I, uh, as I said, um, I'd like to see a bigger sample size. I'd like to hear from more people. I'd like to have a chance to get and talk to people as well, but uh, we will have an opportunity to make that final decision in a, probably in the, within the next 30 days. And uh, we certainly respect everything that you've said. And uh, there is a concern. Obviously, COVID has been a, you know, a, a disaster for many small businesses and uh, we, we don't we don't want to hinder anybody. I, I, I'm completely supportive of you, uh, but there is going to be upset with this construction, whether it's this year or next year. And, uh, you know, uh, as I think Councillor Taylor said, we got to bite the bullet at some point. So anyway, we, we uh, I think, that, you know, what I'm hearing is people are leaning towards uh, putting this off, but uh, I, th I think we need to get a little bit more information. I'd like to hear uh, more from the BIA and uh, uh, we'll, uh, We'll support what what the consensus is. It certainly seems to be uh, pushing it off for a year. It seems to be the consensus. So, thank you, Ms. Witcher. Okay, thank All you best. for having me. All Bye. the best. Yeah. Okay, um, Council, let's move along here. Um, so, uh, Deputy Mayor, um, I'm going to turn the proceedings over to you for the statutory public meeting. Um, as I said earlier, I have a, a direct uh, pecuniary interest here as my son is involved in the 41 William Street project. 
So I will be bowing out of the meeting. Um, Madam Clerk, perhaps you can text me when uh, I can come back in. I will do so, Mr. Mayor. All the best. Thank you. Thank you, Worship. Uh, this is the procedure we'd be following tonight. Anyone who would like to speak to this matter can call 1-289-801-5789. Seven four, and enter conference ID number seven three six seven zero two six pound sign. Callers will be invited to provide their questions or comments following the conclusion of this meeting presentation. Anyone who wants to be notified of further consideration of this topic, please submit your name, phone number, mailing address, and email address to planning at orangeville.ca or call 519-941-0440 extension, extension 2254 and reference the file number RZ-2021-01. Please note that any information collected is a matter of public record. So we'll start off tonight with a presentation by the Town Planning Division. Uh, Mr. Ward, the floor is yours. Thank you, De Deputy Mayor, and good evening, everyone, and, and welcome to those in attendance um, to a public meeting that's being held tonight with respect to a uh, zoning bylaw amendment application that's been received by the town. So as with any public meetings, um, this meeting is is really an information sharing uh, event. It's, it's intended to provide more information about the applications and the uh, development proposal that's under consideration and also to obtain input from members of the community and answer questions um, with respect to any any questions that may be asked at tonight's meeting. Uh, staff take the input received at tonight's meeting into consideration as part of our overall review and eventually we would come back with a, a recommendation to council for a decision. Uh, tonight's public meeting there are there are no decisions made, uh, no positions taken or, or opinions made with respect to the application in consideration. So here's a snapshot of, of the applications, uh, the application that is that's been received. Again, it, it's a zoning bylaw amendment that's been submitted for property known as 41 Williams Street. Uh, I'll, I'll get into a little more details with respect to its location and, and the proposed development composition, but essentially it's it's consists of three parts. One is first and foremost to maintain the existing dwelling that exists on the property. Um, the second part is to construct a, uh, a new single detached dwelling more closely oriented to the intersection that the property is, is situated near. And then finally to construct a, uh, a semi-detached dwelling um, sort of situated in behind the, the existing detached dwelling on the property. So here's a location of, of the subject lands. Um, as you can see, they're, they're situated right at the intersection of, of Hannah Street and Williams Street. The property itself is is a rather large property in comparison to, to those that, that surround it. Uh, it is situated in a mature residential area. Um, the, the area does comprise predominantly of detached dwellings. There are some semi-detached and, and even low-rise apartments sort of um, speckled throughout the area. Um, as you'll see, Town Line is, is situated just somewhat to the south and, and east of the subject lands. And then the then you have John Street more to the north with uh, Bathia Street to the south. So here's a, an image of the proposed development, as I mentioned earlier. As you can see, the existing dwelling is sort of situated centrally within this uh, um, sort of sizable uh, parcel. Um, it is actually comprised of two historic um, individual lots as part of the original uh, subdivision layout for these lands. And, and I won't get into that in a lot of detail. The applicant is present and they will speak to the um, sort of the evolution of the development concept in a little more detail. And again, there's the uh, detached dwelling proposed to be situated sort of very close to the intersection. And then again, with the, uh, the semi-detached dwellings uh, situated in behind. There is a uh, an existing detached garage that's situated in the in the location where the uh, semi-detached is, is proposed, and and that detached uh, garage would be removed as part of the uh, development proposal. 
So the town's official plan designates the lands as part of the, the broader area as, as residential. And, and as one might expect, that the residential land use designation permits uh, certainly the, the complete range of, of residential uh, dwelling types. Um, the policy framework that exists sort of articulates uh, a little more precision with with the different types of, of residential units uh, types and, so, and densities um, through a residential designa density designation uh, framework that I'll get into momentarily. Uh, the residential policies uh, do contain some direction for intensification. It's the intensification is, is essentially where you have new development occurring within a built up area that is at, a, at, is at a higher density than what already exists on the property and, and within its surroundings. Um, intensification is, is not only in, encouraged by the policy framework, it's, it's quite frankly to be expected. Uh, so insofar as the, the town's planning policies do contain a, a target for um, the amount of growth, new residential growth that is to be to occur in the town through intensification. It's 50% of, of any new growth occurring annually is to occur in form of intensification within our, our built up area. And, and this sort of falls in, in alignment with the prevailing policy framework of, of the county and the province, recognizing that, that there's certain benefits to building or accommodating new growth that is through intensification and it follows sort of that fundamental planning approach that we've adopted in our, our provincial policy driven system that is essentially grow within before you grow outward. So there, there's certainly some some policy support for the de uh, development occurring through intensification. But with that said, however, our policies do have some criteria with respect to looking at intensification areas as well as criteria for evaluating actual intensification development proposals that come forward. Namely, the criteria involves looking at those areas that are sort of large, um, larger and maybe underutilized and therefore can accommodate some more intensive development than what, what might exist. And in terms of the criteria to evaluate new intensification developments, obviously the, the key points are making sure that it's consistent with it or compatible uh, with its surroundings. And in terms of compatibility, I, I just want to point out that it's not necessarily just being duplicate of what exists. There's recognition that, again, that intensification is going to be um, different in terms of a, a density, in terms of rel its relationship to its surroundings, but it, it must be in harmony and, and basically in a, in a compatible nature with its surroundings. And there's certainly design aspects that can uh, can, can help ensure that it is maintained. So here's the uh, residential density plan that I was speaking to earlier. This is where the, uh, the, the residential framework gets a little more prescriptive in terms of the uh, permissions. The low density designation applies to the subject property as well as the surrounding neighborhood. This designation permits single detached as well as two unit dwellings and it prescribes an overall density of, of 25 units per hectare. It's important to note that that density is, is applied more on a neighborhood level rather than a, a certain property or, or a collection of property basis. It's, it's a much broadly applied um, density value. So the zoning bylaw zones the subject property as, as R2, what I'll call R2, the, the second density zone. As you can see, this zone category applies to um, the, the, the broader area. Um, there are other zone categories sort of dispersed throughout the uh, area uh, consistent with the um, sort of the semi-detached and, and low-rise multiples that I was referring to earlier in terms of surrounding uh, land use environment. The R2 zone permits only single detached dwellings, so it, it is implementing the official plan policy, but at a much more prescriptive level of detail. Because the proposed development involves a semi-detached dwelling, the, the applicant is seeking to rezone the lands to uh, the R3 zone, which permits single detached and semi-detached dwelling, dwellings. Sorry, as, as part of the zoning bylaw amendment, they are seeking a number of um, special provisions, sort of special uh, values with respect to the zone standards regarding setbacks, uh, lot size, et cetera. Uh, a lot of that is largely due to, and if you can see on the slide here in the zone category and of the zone schedule, specifically the boundary of, of Hannah Street, you can see it's sort of irregular. It, it sort of jogs out 
along the subject property relative to the, the lands beside it. That's a result of two abutting original historic plans of subdivision that prescribe a different uh, right of way width for Hannah Street. And what happens is you have that irregularity in the lot fabric. However, the road actually goes through rather seamlessly in a, in a linear fashion. So albeit that the um, many of the special provision proposed through this amendment uh, are, are necessitated by that. The, the reality is what the applicants are trying to do is, is develop a, a building footprint that's sort of going to mimic the, um, the actual physical setback to the street, um, fairly consistent with what exists in the area. I'll, I know the applicants will probably speak to that in a little more detail. So in terms of the circulation comments we've received so far, um, many of these are articulated in the information report that's included on the agenda, but um, we have received some comments of, with respect to no concerns or, or typical items they would like to see implemented in the approval from some of our um, public agencies, particularly the utilities and the school boards. In terms of internal. Review Heritage Orangeville looked at this more recently. Um, they are fairly supportive of the development concept given that it is maintaining that existing uh, detached dwelling on the property. It is a listed property on the town's municipal heritage register. So they were supportive of that coming forward in a manner that's preserving the dwelling as is. They did offer some comments with respect to the proposed development, sort of having a massing that's, that's somewhat in alignment with the existing dwelling. And, and that's been provided to, to staff for review. Um, infrastructure Services Environment Divisions, as well as their Transportation and Development uh, Group, have looked at this with respect to groundwater infiltration. The applicant has submitted information with respect to stormwater management and infiltration. They propose a feature on the property to enhance some infiltration uh, to mitigate any potential stormwater management impacts that you might, you might occur through uh, new development. And our transportation and development division is certainly reviewing this with respect to the servicing uh, regime proposed for this new development. So in terms of public feedback, I, I won't, I, I've attempted to summarize this with, without a whole lot of detail, recognizing that there's considerable correspondence included on this evening's agenda for council's information. And, and surely the purpose of course of this meeting is, is to obtain the public feedback directly, but we've certainly uh, heard the comments received so far and, and are continuing to take that into consideration. Namely, what we've seen so far of, of course is concern with compatibility of the proposed new units relative to the existing neighborhood character, some concern about Hannah Street and its ability to accommodate the new um, development proposed on this location, particularly with respect to parking and driveway access and so forth, as well as uh, what might this decision mean for other areas in, the, in this particular neighborhood? Might this be a pre precedent setting matter um, that, that could sort of create more opportunity or more consideration of similar developments of this nature going forward. So in terms of next steps, again, tonight's public meeting is really an information sharing exercise. Uh, it is an important step in the process to, to take this uh, commentary and, and evaluate it as part of our overall review of the application. Um, eventually, we will bring forward a proposal or a recommendation for Council's consideration, having taken the, the full review into consideration and following which should the application be approved, the, the applicant would need to pursue additional planning approval, some of which are, are discussed in more detail in the information report. Uh, with that said, I understand the, the applicant's planning consultant as well as the applicant is, is present tonight and will certainly be able to speak in a little more detail to the proposal and, and will be available to answer any questions. That concludes my presentation. My, my contact information is on the slide before you. If, if anyone has any questions, feel free to contact me directly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ward. Uh, we'll now hear from Andrea Sinclair from MHBC Planning Limited. Andrea, go ahead. Good evening, Deputy Mayor, members of Council, and those members of the public watching from home. I'm going to attempt to share, but as I mentioned to Mr. Ward earlier today, my Teams has been a little finicky. So if I'm not able to share, I think he's going to help me out. Um, and I don't know if I just need permission to share a screen. Okay, hold on. OK, 
Okay, is that uh, working on everyone's screen? That's good. Thank you, great. Apparently it only gives me problems when I'm doing every other meeting today. Uh, so my name is Andrea Sinclair. I'm a partner and planner with MHBC. I'm here on behalf of the owners of 41 William Street. And as Mr. Ward said in his presentation, we're really here tonight to hear public uh, comments from the public and any comments or uh, respond to any questions from council. Um, and I'm going to try my best not to repeat too much of the information that was already presented by planning staff, um, but we'll provide a bit more of an overview of what's proposed, um, as well as some preliminary, um, we, we've received the public, we've reviewed the public's letters, and there's a few items that I want to just um, provide some clarification on tonight as well. So I'll skip over the location, but uh, in terms of housing mix, as Mr. Ward mentioned this evening, this is a neighborhood with uh, predominantly single detached, but there are a number of other housing forms in the neighborhood. This diagram shows in the yellow circles um, existing semi-detached uh, buildings in the neighborhood. The orange shows uh, apartments or converted dwellings that have been converted to three or more units. So as you can see the property outlined in red, um, there are a couple of apartment buildings all along William Street currently. Um, of note, the second sort of, if you see the second orange circle in from town line, uh, that's I believe an eight unit apartment building that's the exact same size as um, 41 William Street in terms of the lot size. And then there's a larger apartment building further down, uh, sort of central to the neighborhood near William Street and Henry. So there is uh, sort of a mix of housing within the neighborhood already. Uh, just one quick correction and apologies, the bottom photo on the bottom right it talks about a new build on John Street. That should have said Henry Street. And if everyone can see my cursor, that's this lot here at the intersection of William and Henry. Henry operates in a similar fashion to Hannah. And this was a situation where the existing deep lot, there was a severance and there's now a, a home, in this case, a single detached that fronts onto Henry Street. So um, somewhat similar to what's being proposed on this property, uh, but 41 Williams, a much larger property. And I'm actually going to skip and then come back to this. Um, one thing I just wanted to confirm with council is just the design evolution that has occurred since the time that my clients purchased the property. So they looked at a number of um, options before landing with what they've submitted with the zone change. Uh, so when they first looked at purchasing the property, they had ideas about removing the house and building an apartment or a townhouse development. Um, but early into the due diligence phase, they learned that the house was actually listed on the heritage registry and felt there was some real value in keeping that house and maintaining it on the street. Um, so that we moved away pretty quickly from any type of option where we were tearing down that house. Um, another option was looking at the semis on Hannah and converting the existing house to a fourplex. So that would have resulted in a total of six units. Uh, there was also look, look um, uh, concepts where we had townhomes proposed on Hannah Street. You could fit three townhouse units. That was reviewed with planning staff in advance of making an application. And while planning staff do not form uh, provide a formal opinion at pre-consultation, they are able to sort of confirm whether there's some apprehension. And it was um, really felt through our discussions with planning staff and my discussions with our client that really sticking to singles and semis is going to be uh, compatible with the existing community and the types of housing that's already there. And we also looked at adding an additional unit to 41 William Street, but knew that was um, going to result in more tree removal. So where we've landed and what we think is an appropriate um, use of this property, which is underutilized today, is a total of four units, including the existing house, which will remain. And as I mentioned earlier, um, the exact same size parcel further down the street is being used as a eight unit apartment building. So this is, uh, you know, if you look at it in terms of units, it's sort of half the density of that block. Um, going back to the proposal overview. So um, planning staff provided a great uh, summary of the proposal. I don't want to repeat too much of it, but in terms of some of the comments we've heard from the public and some of the things I wanted to clarify, um, you can, if you can see my cursor, the existing driveway is sort of in the area of the back of the pinky color and the start of the light blue. That's an existing driveway out to Hannah Street. Um, so there was a concern about adding more driveways. This driveway with the proposal will not remain. It'll be removed. 
So the new driveways for the semis will be uh, further away from the intersection, which will be um, better in terms of traffic movements, but there isn't the intent to also keep the existing driveway. Um, in terms of the single detached on William, as was mentioned earlier, there was already a lot um, created in an older plan of subdivision. It was just never constructed. So if you go along William Street today, you'll actually see the curb cut where the driveway was to go. And there's also been services extended to this, um, to both parts of this lot as if sort of um, a two lot scenario. So there was always a contemplation of an additional lot at the intersection. And um, as mentioned, there's a quite a wide uh, portion of the publicly owned right of way that really, if you're on the street today, you wouldn't um, recognize that it's part of the right of way. It's always been maintained as part of the lot and it would continue to still function that way, even though the ownership is te technically the town. Um, in terms of other comments um, that I've reviewed in terms of the preliminary letters uh, supported, uh, uh, provided by some of the neighbors. Um, in terms of parking, there was concerns about parking on the street. So just wanted to confirm that while we are proposing some um, site specific regulations, we are not asking for reduction in parking. Each of these units will meet the bylaw requirement for on site parking. Um, there was also concerns about the semi units and the fact that these could have basement apartment units and that would result in even more density on the site. Um, just wanted to confirm that within the town's existing bylaw, you cannot have accessory apartments with tandem parking. So if a future owner of one of these units wanted to pursue an, a basement apartment, they would still need to come back for additional approvals, either through a zone change or a variance, which would be another public process. Um, and the neighbors would have a, an opportunity to speak at that time. Um, so that's not part of this proposal. Similarly, um, concerns that the existing house could be converted into three or four units. The zoning that we're seeking really only allows singles and semis um, to do a converted dwelling with more than three units. We would have had to go to an R5 zone. And that's not what's being proposed today. Um, and then another comment uh, in reading through was about the tenure and whether or not these would be rentals. And as council is obviously aware, um, zoning doesn't dictate the ownership um, or the tenure of properties, it dictates use. So um, while my understanding is our client is going to be selling these as lots, if this um, zone change is successful, um, he'll be selling them as lots, but we can't control through zoning if someone buys them and stays in them or if they buy them and rent them out. Um, but there is a, a rental shortage in Orangeville. Vacancy rate is very low um, and the Planning Act and uh, provincial policy statements really do encourage the full range of housing, including the full range of tenure. So it's it's not something that um, I don't believe planning staff would want to try to control or, or and it's not something that planning staff can control through zoning. Um, in terms of official plan, we've reviewed both the Dufferin County official plan and the local official plan. Um, planning staff already provided the confirmation that there's an obligation to have 50% of intensification within the built up area. I just wanted to reconfirm as well that an official plan amendment is not required in support of this development. The official plan would already permit singles and semis. Um, so it's only a zone change that we are proceeding with. Uh, there's been a number of technical reports submitted in support of the application. As uh, mentioned by planning staff, these are currently being reviewed. Comments will be circulated to our office and we'll be responding um, accordingly when we receive those comments. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention trees, just given uh, some of the comments from council earlier tonight on the other agenda items. Um, an arborist report and tree management plan was prepared in support of the application and efforts have been made to um, retain the trees where possible. Um, the development would result in some tree removals and I understand there's not currently a tree bylaw within Orangeville. Um, however, the owners of the, uh, the, owners of the property are um, certainly willing to talk to staff about what can be done to sort of maintain some canopy and whether that means replanting on the site, um, replanting within the publicly owned boulevard surrounding the site, or potentially making contributions for some canopy, uh, some new tree planting elsewhere in the town. That's certainly something um, our client is willing to explore with staff because um, we can definitely hear loud and clear that um, it's important to council to sort of preserve or, or enhance the tree canopy where possible. 
uh, believe this has already been discussed, but we are seeking an amendment to the zoning in terms of um, going from an R2 to an R3. And then if the zoning goes through, then the lots would have to be then created through part lot control. And um, we will work through arrangements with the town in terms of the street right of way on Hannah, which will form sort of the side yard, but any buildings constructed will be well outside of that, um, the town owned parcel. Um, so in conclusion, there's a, there's a detailed planning report that um, I'm sure council has been made aware of. Um, the intensification, this, what we're looking for is really a more modest form of intensification with housing types that are already found in the community. Um, and it's in conformity with the official plan, the county's official plan, the local and provincial policy. And we're really just here tonight to hear from the public, hear from council, answer any questions and are looking forward to working through with um, planning staff and this will come back at a later date. So thank you and I'll exit out of this. Thank you very much, Ms. Sinclair. Um, now we have a couple of uh, other speakers that wish to comment on this. So I'll call on Frank Pessy and Lisa Felice, please. Can you hear us? Finally, we get to speak to you. Hi, we were out on the deck, but it was raining, so we came inside. <laughs> um, so I've never done this before, so please bear with us. Um, there's actually another neighbor, Denise, here. And, and um, so I'm going to go through some notes, as are they. Um, mine are basically statements, and there are some questions. And if you'd like me to send the questions after so that the uh, town council can ponder them and, and come up with answers, I'm, I'm good with that. Please, if you could. If Sorry? you, could. If you yeah. could send them, that would be yeah. appreciated. Can I get an email address maybe after the meeting as to where I can send them? Okay. okay. Um, so we understand the need for intensification. We understand the town of Orangeville needs this. We, we understand that it's about tax dollars. Um, I think the biggest thing we have a problem with is the R3 zoning. So uh, contradicting uh, Ms. Sinclair, there is no R3 zoning on Hannah Street. There is no R3 zoning on Henry Street at all. I'm sorry, my voice is shaking because I'm kind of upset about this. Um, all, all R2 zoning um, that was converted to R3 on William Street and Hannah Street is very bottom heavy. It is not sprinkled throughout the neighborhood. It is mainly on um, south of Hannah to town line, and then there's only one semi at the north end. The bulk of it is detached homes. Um, I also have concern about the semis going in and accessory apartments going in the basement. The reason I have such a, a concern about this is that I am in real estate and I'm aware of the sales in the last year. Sorry, let me just breathe for a second. Um, I'm aware of the sales in this area. I'm aware of the number of non-conforming apartments. And from June 1st, 2020 to June 7th, 2021, 103 units have sold in Orangeville with accessory apartments. Only 11 were legal. So that opens us up to having four residences in the two semis. Um, these are fronting onto my backyard. So when I sit on my deck right now, I see the side of the Victorian home, I see trees, and according to the Arborist report, 24 perfectly healthy trees are going to be cut down for this. Not a few, as Ms. Sinclair stated, 24. It is going to cause pollution. It is going to cause noise pollution. We are also, we also know that at the corner of John Street and Town Line, eventually are going to be townhouses. So it is going to be extremely noisy with all of the trees that are going to be removed. Um, so allowing this to happen is going to set a precedent. Again, there is no R3 on Hannah. There is no R3 on Henry at all. Opening this up, is it going to allow R3 zoning for 42, 44, 62, 64, and 66 John Street, 5 Henry Street, and 37 William, which is my house. Um, and I haven't even mentioned Margaret Street. This goes right directly down to Margaret Street. To intensify to R3, Hannah and Henry Street only measure 18 and a half feet wide. 
When two cars are parked on the road, there's less than four feet between them. There's less than four feet between them. Um, for those of us such as myself that have decided to beautify our homes and to keep our lots intact, this is a negative effect on resale value um, due to lack of backyard privacy, noise, townhouses that are going to be going in and the town line area. Another issue I'd like to address is snow removal, which is a huge issue already on Hannah Street and I'm assuming Henry. These are narrow streets that we cannot park on in the winter, but we're allowed to because they're, they allow parking. There are times where I can't get in my driveway. There's a right of way right behind my house where the, the, where the owner can't get into his driveway. Um, there's going to be an issue as to where they're going to put their snow when they shovel their driveway because they are taking up so much of that lot with all the concessions. They're going to have no room to put their snow anywhere. Um, so where the proposed semi is going to be, like, I just want to know where they're going to put the snow. And I do know for a fact that two Margaret Street had to have their snow removed, I believe, last year because they had nowhere to put it. <laughs> because they've intensified that lot so greatly and I feel they're going to do the same thing here. Um, sewer, water supply, I don't believe there's anything running up and down Hannah Street, Henry Street, so I'd like to know um, where will they be digging, how much it's going to cost, who's paying for it, is there a setup, is this a setup for future R3 because if it is and this is allowed, this potentially surrounds my house with R3 in the future potentially. So I'm concerned about that. Um, there are items in our official plan that do not comply as far as I'm concerned. Um, and the developers of William Street can intensify by putting a detached house facing William. They could put a detached house behind it where the proposed semi is supposed to go, which will model the uh, example that Miss Sinclair gave saying that it was a similar setup, which it's not. Um, they have a detached house on the severance at William and Henry Street. They do not have a semi there. And we are not opposed to that. Um, so to recap, R3 does not comply in our opinion. There's only R3 at the south end and only one at the north end. Um, it is not sprinkled throughout the uh, subdivision. There are privacy issues, there are safety issues, there are environmental issues. And I think that's all I have to say before I start crying. <laughs> Go ahead, Frank. <laughs> Um, good, good evening, everyone, and, and Deputy Mayor. Um, some of the some of the things, some of the notes that I have here um, actually cross over a bit with what what Lisa said. But you know, certainly we do understand the town. Uh, you know, the operating plan, the town's operating plan, and the county operating plan. You know, specifies that 50% of new growth shall come with, you know, because of intensification and infill. But, you know, the, I think that the town is, if I may suggest, that there's sort of, there's two sides to the coin. On one hand, they're saying they, they need to, that the policy dictates that this is, this shall be this 50% infill. But you know, if you look in the if you look at the town plan, it's rife with all kinds of direction about the kind of infill that shall be permitted. For example, um, the the town's operating plan provides policy direction with respect to facilitating residential growth, and it says to assist in achieving this target, the operating plan identifies various sites intended for future intensification which are listed on schedule B1. The subject lands are not identified as intensification area on schedule B1. For the town to evaluate intensification developments, the policies prescribe an additional series of criteria to be taken into consideration. For example, compatibility with adjacent buildings and adjacent residential areas, shadowing and access to sunlight for such areas, as adjacent private property, public parks, and sidewalks. We have no sidewalks. <laughs> the urban impacts and design to uh, alternate alternative design uh, and des design options, including scale and the relationship to addition to adjacent street widths. The street is 18 and a half feet wide. 
I'm not entirely sure how you could put a semi-detached with four cars coming in and out of there on an 18 foot street. With two adjacent driveways. However, you know, the, the, the plan goes on and on. And, you know, when you get to section D, uh, which, which concerns policies, for example, section D7, new development will be located and organized to fit with its neighbors or plan context. It will frame and support adjacent streets, parks and open spaces to improve the safety, pedestrian interest and casual views to these spaces. New development will locate and organize vehicle parking, vehicular access, service areas and utilities and will improve the safety and attractiveness of adjacent streets, parks and open spaces. I can't see how putting three houses on a lot where there was one is going to improve the look of the, the street. New development will be masked to fit harmoniously into its surroundings and will respect and improve the local scale and character. The operating plan is full of let's keep Orangeville quaint, let's keep the historic charm. This is not doing that. It's not doing it, it's doing the opposite. Infill development will respect and reinforce the general physical patterns and characters of established neighborhoods with particular regard to patterns of streets, blocks and lanes, heights, massing, scale and type of dwelling unit compatible with the zoning bylaw permitted for that area. And right now, the, book, the zoning bylaws are two, not R3. Prevailing patterns of rear and yard sidebacks and landscape open space. So I just want to remind council that there's this 50% mandate to infill and intensify, but none of the other none of the other criteria I don't believe is being properly looked at. That's the first thing I'd like to say. In this in the summary, the first summary, the public feedback to date, comments have indicated the following general concerns with the application. That letter that we wrote and, and, and sent in to town council did not have general concerns. It had very, very specific concerns, including access. Hannah is a very narrow speed, street, more of a lane. It, begin, it basically becomes a one-way street when someone parks on the road. There's simply not enough room for three vehicles. Safety, there's a lot of foot traffic on Hannah Street. There are no sidewalks. Residents have to walk on the road. There is a very real chance that someone could be injured by one of the at least four cars backing out of the semi-detached driveways should they happen to be walking down the road. Parking, there is a potential for eight more vehicles to need to be parked. Most will end up parking on the road because you know the way it works. Nobody wants to move vehicles. They always park their cars on the road. The semi-detached unit is a privacy. The semi-detached unit is a two-story dwelling which will look right into the backyards of adjacent properties. Density, read Mrs. Bigler's letter, which is the last letter in the package on the agenda. She details how the town's encouragement of infill and intensification has led to a preponderance of investment rest rental units and non-conforming apartments on William Street in the immediate area. And of course, as Lisa said, this precedent setting, a potential precedent setting status for other similar developments to come forward should this application be approved. The old house at the corner of Henry and William, which is up there right now, the old blue house, is just a couple of hundred down, yards down from the road that the same kind of development could occur on. And if you're down, I'm next. I think I'm finished. I, uh, we have Brenda Keller here. She wants to make a couple of statements, if that's okay, too. That's okay. You go right ahead. I will keep it quick. I can reiterate everything my uh, neighbors have said to me and I will make it this attempt, attempt to intensify isn't 50%. It's not even 100%. It's not, it will potentially be more than 200%. I can give you the fact, yes, there's probably room for another house on that property, but 
this rezoning is an attempt to intensify a corner far more intense than what that intersection and laneway was ever designed to bear. And the safety issue is a big one, especially with people walking so much more. Um, if there's parking on the street, the school bus can't get around that corner as is. And snow plows, well, that's another story. <laughs> you need to look at that. It is a corner. It's not just a lot being intensified. It's a corner. Double the roads. And thank you for listening. Thank you, uh, Ms. Felice. If yeah. you want to email your stuff to planning at orangeville.ca. Is that Brandon's email address? That will get to him, yes. Okay, planning, sorry, could you repeat planning that? Planning at orangeville.ca. Okay. And reference number RZ-2021-01. I got a glasses on and I can't see what I'm writing. Can you start the, the reference number again? R2. RZ. Oh, RZ, okay. Dash two zero. Mm -hmm. Two one dash zero one. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have another speaker. Yes, uh, Deputy Mayor McIntosh, may I just interject for a moment, please? Absolutely. Um, the, with Andrew Sinclair, there was also the addition of Spencer Brown. So if you could just uh, at some point go back to Spencer Brown and give him the opportunity to address the council, please. Okay, I was going to get to him, but uh, I, we, he can go on now, I guess, would be appropriate. Mr. Brown? Sorry, I'm sorry. De Deputy Mayor, I just have one. Can I just say one more thing? Sure. The In the summary that the planning Depart department put together, they said that several comments uh, were received, several, several inquiries and comments had been received by nearby residents. I'd just like to just like to point out that there wasn't several. There were 57 letters of concern from residents in the neighborhood. It wasn't just one or two or five or ten. There were 57 letters, and some of the letters had two signatures on them. Yeah, and that was only William Street, John Street, and Margaret. So that I are mean, immediately there's, there's a tremendous amount of opposition to this to this proposal. Just that's I think I've said enough. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Brown. Uh, thank you. It's Spencer Brown here. I'm speaking in favor of the project. I just wanted to. Uh, I'm. Can everybody hear me? We lost you a bit, but we can, can hear you now. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. OK, perfect. Um, Sorry, Spencer speaking in favor of the development. Uh, I just want to give a little background on us and the project. So I'm a partner on this project with Duncan uh, and Duncan and I grew up in Orangeville together. We went to ODSS um, Elementary School at Credit Meadows. Um, Duncan actually lives in the William Street neighborhood and that's how we found this property for sale as Duncan was actually walking by. So we are sensitive to the neighborhood and and you know, we, we do believe that we are improving the neighborhood um, and we've uh, circulated a letter uh, to the immediate surrounding neighbors and we've made ourselves available to, to provide a few clarifications and we've made ourselves available uh, to discuss with neighbors. We delivered a letter last week and we have had a couple discussions uh, with the neighbors and obviously we're looking forward to hearing more tonight. I just sort of want to give a high level background. I wonder if Spencer just needs to turn his video off and uh, speak with hey, audio. Sorry, Spencer, my, 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 my internet uh, is not so good. Am I, I back now? You need to turn your video off, Spencer, and you'll be fine. Okay. Dang. Maybe not so fine. And usually when this happens, the chair sings. Perhaps you can phone in. Yes, Maybe. Spencer, if you could phone in, that would be great.
Give me one second, I will text Spencer. Hi there, it's Spencer. Is anyone, can anyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, sorry guys. This is bad, bad time for my internet to go out. I just got two more minutes here. Uh, we're in a housing crisis right now in, in Orangeville. You know, we've had many friends move out of town because of the high prices and lack of supply. And we think this is a great opportunity to provide new housing for new families to get into the market, especially the semi-detached house. <laughs> Is once built out, it'll be at a price that average families can afford, uh, which is limited in Orangeville. Uh, infill development, as Brandon mentioned, it's much needed and supported by policy at all levels. It helps to limit urban sprawl. It's a greener way to develop than in subdivisions outside of town as you're removing natural areas. Um, you're also with infill development providing housing within walking and biking distance to work in amenities, uh, which uh, you know, provides less emissions from cars. It's also an efficient form of development and services and roads are already available. It doesn't cost the town anymore uh, while increasing property taxes without increasing expenses. At the 41 William level, we're keeping the house to maintain the character of the neighborhood. As Andrea went through, we've done lots of different design concepts to come up with this one, which we believe is a gentle intensification. And that's a term that has come up a lot in our discussions with uh, town staff that 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 you know we're proposing gentle intensification okay we are in a diverse neighborhood here in William Street there's singles and semis low-rise apartment buildings fourplexes and group homes on a parcel this large more density could be proposed but like I said you know we thought doing the semi and the semi and single approach was best for the neighborhoods and would achieve this gentle intensification uh, we did originally propose five units with one attached to the existing and we had a few productive conversations with town staff about that but for a few reasons we decided that four would be more appropriate uh, including keeping more trees and maintaining the, the look of the existing house. Uh, one more point is that as Andrea mentioned that it's already two lots that are actually serviced and so you know we're going from two to four in some respects rather than one to four just sort of a, a note on that. Um, and also there was some talk at the PIC before this meeting about trees and in, in talking with the neighbors and some counselors ahead of this meeting, you know, we've heard that uh, the tree canopy is a, is a major concern. And so we've, uh, we've complied with all town policies regarding trees thus far. Uh, however, we are aware that the town council has made it a mandate to increase the canopy in Orangeville uh, through the Sustainable Orangeville Initiative. And we are open to working with the town on seeing if we can plant more trees on our existing site, you know, plant trees on the town boulevard and, and potentially work with Sustainable Orangeville uh, to do some tree planting and, and canopy growth. Um, and one note that I just heard, this is my last point, that uh, safety. So there's actually a site triangle issue right now on the corner of uh, William and Hannah. There's the existing cedar trees that are actually impacting the site triangle so if you're walking from William uh, I guess north towards downtown and a car was coming up Hannah you, you couldn't see it right now so we're actually going to be correcting that that site triangle issue um, which which is a bit of a safety issue in itself uh, that's all for me uh, sorry about the internet and, and thank you very much for your consideration thank you very much um, very informative. We have one more speaker, uh, Mr. Glenn Strudwick. I believe he's the owner of that property. Go ahead, sir. 
sorry, not the owner of 41, but nope. an owner in the neighborhood. So uh, <laughs> good evening, uh, Deputy Mayor and Council. Uh, first of all, my name is Glenn Strudwick. I am the owner of 47 William Street. Um, one of the reasons why I wish to oppose this this uh, uh, proposal, uh, first of all, I've been a resident at 47 William Street for the last 21 years. Previously, I was a resident across the road at 56 William Street from 1979 to 1988. So previously, I did have roots in the area. One of the reasons why I purchased the house at 47 William Street is not only because it's heritage significance, the house was constructed in 1877 and is one of the 25 oldest homes in the town of Orangeville, was also because of the quiet and quaint neighborhood that it offered. Unlike the two adjacent streets, such as Bethia and John, William Street does not go to Broadway. It terminates at Church Street. This makes it a very quiet street for children to play, people to walk, places to park, and to enjoy the quieter side of town. Hence the reason why I purchased 47 William Street 21 years ago. That's a little bit about me. The next thing I want to address is the presentation by the town and by the applicant. The first thing I want to clarify is there's a lot of reference to RM1, RM2, and RM3 zoning. Those are just what the properties presently are zoned in the neighborhood. This does not account for the approximately six to seven single family residences that contain legal or illegal basement apartments from town line up to Hannah Street. This excludes the RM1, RM2, and RM3 zoning properties. So based on that, the remainder of the single family dwelling units that likely only represent eight to 10 units, six to seven of them contain possibly legal or illegal basement apartments. And that's a concern for the neighborhood. We talk about maintaining the character of the neighborhood. And I feel that, as you said, this proposal is not going to do that. The other reason why, as being a resident in the area, the house in question was old Mrs. Wilson's house, as we used to refer to it as children. She lived there from the 60s until at least the 80s or 90s. And then it was purchased by a single family resident. And a single family resident has lived in there for as long as I can remember, which is likely over 50 or 60 years. The proposal put in place, whether it's four dwelling units, five dwelling units, or six dwelling units, drastically increases the intensification of the area. We're not talking 50%, we're talking 400%. It's going from a single family dwelling to four dwellings on the same property. And that doesn't take into consideration all the other zoning and basement apartment issues that exist presently. As previously discussed by my other representatives who are opposed to this project, it also deals with the parking issue, the safety issue, and let alone the future, which we can't always under understand what's going to take place, we don't have a crystal ball, but the potential future of what is going to transpire in the neighborhood, whether it be the old Orangeville Flowers property or any of the adjacent properties in the area. So I just wanted to bring to council's attention, as well as the developer, that I am opposed as many other rep representatives in the neighborhood to this development taking place for the following reasons. And thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Mr. Trudwick. Madam Clerk, are there any other questions from the general public regarding this application? I just need to confirm with Mona and Dan if they have anyone else on the line. Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, there's currently nobody else on the line. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I would invite Andrea Sinclair. Uh, does she have any comments on the uh, submissions by the general public? Thank you. Uh, no, heard the submissions loud and clear, so we will um, 
we've taken note of everything tonight and um, we'll continue working through as we get circulation comments and get the full weight of comments from the town. But as my um, client indicated, we are um, certainly open to more consultation with the neighborhood if there's um, a need for some sort of smaller group discussions on this, um, but have heard the comments raised today and uh, we'll work through with staff on the best way to approach those uh, comments coming back to council sometime in the future. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments from council? Ms. Councillor Taylor. Yes, thank you, Deputy Mayor. I have two if you'll indulge me. You go right ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, to Mr. Ward, I just wanted to understand, um, I did go to that area. I did walk around and, and look at the property. The cedars, which I thought were quite lovely, um, are they a traffic hazard? Are they causing an issue that town would prefer that they weren't there? Or what is the status of that rather unique street and hedge? Certainly through you, Deputy Mayor to Councillor Taylor, as as was noted, those those trees are within the uh, site triangle. Um, in terms of being able to comment on if they're a safety concern, that's sort of outside my, my planning scope. However, you know, our zoning bylaw does have a provision with respect to site triangles and it's it's rather subjective in terms of the zone language. It describes a certain area within the intersection that comprises the the site triangle and it, it simply uh, disallows anything that might be seen to be an obstruction for uh, a visual obstruction to traffic movement in the intersection. Okay. Deputy Mayor, may I ask one other question? Yes, go right ahead. If I may, and uh, this is a, a little bit out of sorts here, but uh, there's been some interesting accusations or interesting comments made by neighbors who I assume would know because they live there, but uh, there's been significant references to illegal basement apartments that are in the area. So I guess my question is probably I'll just defer to uh, CAO Brennan and ask him, are we are we looking into this? Uh, there seems to be an issue in this area. Can we have some next steps and some research done on what's happening here? And if they're illegal, um, what are next steps? Uh, Deputy Mayor, uh, through you to Councillor Taylor, uh, I will discuss this with uh, with uh, Madam Clerk, who oversees uh, bylaw and property standards. Uh, normally, we do not respond to uh, such incidents unless someone reports it and has a legit complaint. Uh, maybe we can touch base with the presenters or the speakers tonight who referenced it, and uh, we'll, we will take it from there uh, and follow up according. Thank you, Mr. Brennan. Very very reasonable response. Thank you. Are there any other questions from members of council? Councillor Andrews. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Mayor McIntosh. Um, Mr. Ward, uh, there was reference made to a eight unit apartment unit um, a little bit further north there, I guess it was Henry. Um, were there similar uh, expressions of concern historically? Again, I, I, you know, going through the information that we've been privileged to, uh, I know that it was referenced, but it just for the, the sake of context, um, uh, do you have any information that you can share with us? Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor to Councillor Andrews, that, that site I believe is zoned in a different category from the sort of the residential R1, R2, R3, it's multiple residential. Okay. So presumably it would have gone through a planning exercise. Uh, I understand the building is, is rather old, so likelihood is that would be more of a historic an older planning exercise that would have went through. Okay, thank you. I just needed that clarification because again, it was referenced uh, a couple of times through the comments that were made tonight. That's all I have at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Andrews. Uh, Councillor Peters. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to Mr. Jones, uh, question regarding the pedestrian access and the snow clearing. Um, I know Public Works would prefer not to have a, a terminus sidewalk, but uh, in the interest of now having new dwellings along that road, would there be any uh, discussions about adding a sidewalk around the corner along Hannah? And if not, when is that uh, road scheduled for redevelopment um, roughly so that we know when a, when a sidewalk may be implemented? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman to Councillor Peters, um, we do have a sidewalk policy that speaks to when sidewalks get added in streets. 
Uh, typically, our policy states that for local roads, sidewalks are appropriate on one side of all local roads and two sides of collectors. Um, in this case, one uh, sidewalk on one side of the road would be appropriate. However, typically, unless council directs otherwise, these sidewalks are installed at the time that the road is reconstructed. We typically don't install uh, a small piece of sidewalk um, that, that doesn't connect to the remaining um, sidewalk network. Um, if there were a sidewalk network to connect to across the frontage of, of this property, that, that's something that could be, could be looked at. With respect to when these roads are scheduled for reconstruction, um, I don't have that at my fingertips, but I don't recall these roads being included in our 10-year capital forecast, so it may be sometime outside of that. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from Council? Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, Councillor Taylor. <laughs> you, you say that. <laughs> is it is it because it's 914, Deputy Mayor? <laughs> uh, I guess I just, you know, in fairness to the applicant, Mr. Brown, I did speak with him prior to this meeting, and my big concern that I brought forward was the tree canopy and the trees that are coming down on the left-hand side of that property as I'm staring at it from the street. Um, there is some beautiful, and I, in memory serves, I think they were red maples, but they're absolutely gorgeous. And I guess I just like to talk a little bit more about that. Based on where he's going to put those buildings, I assume he'd have to put trees on the right-hand side of that property if I was staring at the front of it. Um, what is the math on that? Is it we've heard 24 trees? Is it is it that many that are coming out? Uh, and if it's inappropriate for Mr. Brown to speak, maybe Mr. Ward can speak to it. But uh, I'd love to understand what what the absolute plan is. What's coming out, and what is his commitment to that area of what would go in? Mr. Ward. Certainly through you, Deputy Mayor to Councillor Taylor, I can I can attempt to answer the question and if Mr. Brown has anything to add, perhaps he could shed some further light, but they have submitted a, a tree inventory and, and preservation plan and report as part of this application. Um, there are several trees throughout the site that are proposed for removal, either due to the proposed buildings themselves or some of the uh, servicing connections. Um, some of the trees sort of in the rear corner of the property are proposed to removal. Um, and looking at the concept plan, they're not affected by the building, but perhaps they are affected by some of those infiltration features that the, the stormwater management report recommended for implementation. So this plan, as with all the other plans, are something we will look at more carefully going forward and to see if, you know, perhaps some of these trees slated for removal can be maintained. And, and if not, perhaps we can look at some planting compensation approach. I think the applicant indicated earlier that they were quite willing to explore that with them. So that was certainly encouraging. Yeah, Deputy Mayor. Yes, go right ahead. If I may, I, I think it's I think it's very benevolent that the applicant would suggest that they would plant trees in the rest of town, uh, which hey, I would love as a as a resident of the town. But the reality is, I think it's the area that needs the trees. So if you take them out, I, I think they should stay in the geographic propinquity of of where they are, if at all possible. Um, Anyway, that would be my, I guess it's not really a question, it's more of a comment for your edification. Thank you. Sorry, this is, oh, Spencer ahead. here, can I um, respond? Absolutely. Okay. Sorry, my cell phone's on the internet too, so I, I missed the last uh, little part of, of Mr. Taylor's uh, uh, question or, or comment there. But um, as far as commitments go, you know, all we can really commit to at this point is that we're going to look into it. Um, you know, we have saved as many trees as possible. Um, as uh, uh, Mr. Ward mentioned, some of the trees are being removed for the town's water balance requirements and, and swales. Uh, some trees are being removed for the servicing and some trees are being removed for the actual buildings. So I don't have the arborist report at my fingertips, but you know, the number 24 uh, it is around there. Um, and so, you know, we're going to work with the town and, and we've got to massage the site plan if we can find somewhere on the existing property to put more trees. If we cannot do that, we will look uh, to work with the town at possibly planting some in the boulevard around this area. Again, if that's not possible, then, you know, we'll look to 
um, you know, maybe other areas of town. But yes, we are we are very interested in uh, maintaining the the tree canopy. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any other questions from council? Okay, seeing none, can we have a motion to accept the correspondence tonight? Councillor Taylor, Councillor Andrews, all in favor? Yes. Okay, uh, Mayor Brown can resume as chair. Um, Mr. Deputy Mayor McIntosh, if I could just ask that um, before I text Mayor Brown to rejoin the meeting, if um, you could also um, get a motion to receive the the public meeting report. Okay, could we have that motion, please? Uh, Councillor Peters, Councillor Post, all in favor? Yes. Could we take a five minute break while we get Mayor Brown back? If that's possible. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, for uh, taking us through that meeting. One thing that we forgot, councillors, uh, coming out of closed was a rise in report. So 
we need a motion for uh, the following, and that was the receipt of a confidential verbal report from Ed Brennan, CAO, regarding 120 C line, the rail spur. Um, a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board position plan procedure criteria or instruction to be applied to any negotiation carried on or to be carried on by or or on behalf of the municipality or local board and also that we had a training session council staff relations the meeting was held for the purpose of educating or training the members and then we also had another uh, item which i don't have in front of me here we go uh, again, a uh, confidential verbal report from Ed Brennan, CEO regarding town owned Humber lands, a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board, a position plan, procedure, criteria, or instruction to be applied to any negotiations carried on or to be carried on by or on behalf of the municipality or local board. We have a motion to receive this uh, information, please. Uh, Councillor Sherwood, second by Deputy Mayor McIntosh. All in favor? Yes, thank you. Moving on to correspondence, we have items uh, 10 1 and 10 2. Uh, can we have a motion to receive those two items, please? Mr. Mr. Mayor, if I may, Deputy Mayor McIntosh um, address those particular matters since they were tied to the um, 41 lanes. Good, I'm sorry. All right, very good. Um, so, did we discuss 10.3 uh, yet, folks, or not? No. Okay. All right, for the public, uh, the Solicitor General of Ontario has reached out to councils to ask for their recommendations regarding the composition of OPP detachments, uh, police service boards in the future. Uh, in 2022, there will be a new Police Services Act. And uh, in that, uh, the Solicitor General has reached out and asked for input. Uh, so with respect to that, um, I'm going to read the following letter uh, from our town council. Dear Honorable Sylvia Jones, re the OPP detachment board composition on behalf of the Orangeville Council. Thank you for the letter dated March 17th, 2021, requesting feedback of the development of the new framework for OPP detachment boards. At a special council meeting held on June 2nd, 2021, the following resolution was passed. It is the position of council that Orange will retain an autonomous police service board and that the province discontinue provincial appointments to OPP detachment boards and that the respective municipal council be given authority to, to appoint any required citizen representation, representation to its police services board. Should you have any questions or require further information, do not hesitate to contact me at any time. Sincerely, Mayor Sandy Brown. Uh, councillors, uh, could we have a motion, please, to approve uh, the sending of this letter to the Solicitor General? Councillor Post, seconded by Councillor Sherwood. Anybody wish to make a comment at this point? Councillor Peters. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, it, it may just be getting hung up on the wording here, but uh, I wondered if the intent when we met, um, just looking at the last line, so appoint any required citizen representation um, my understanding of the discussion was that council was looking for control over the entire composition of the board, not necessarily just citizen members. Um, I don't know if I misinterpreted that or if that's how everybody else felt, but uh, I thought the the general direction was was determining the entire composition of the board, and that would that may reflect a, a mix of councillors and citizens uh, or staff or, or other uh, you know members. So I didn't know if that. If I misunderstood or, or if that statement is, you know, accurate to everyone else's mind. Well, Councillor Peters, I guess the uh, second line there and the province discontinue provincial appointments to the OP detachment board. So that removes two of five from the board. And then the next line says that all that we would appoint any required citizen representation. So I'm assuming that council representation will remain the same going forward, uh, which we have uh, two members of council and uh, one publicly appointed representative. So I'm, I'm, I'm unclear as to what you're you're suggesting here. Can you 
reiterate? I, I guess I thought that last sentence would be more broad. Uh, thinking back to your comments specifically, you know, I believe you were saying you'd like council to decide what the composition of that board is, and that may include not only type of member, but number of members, uh, whether it's entirely municipal council or a mix thereof. Um, this seems to imply there would still be citizen representation, um, which I support to a degree, but I, I wondered if when they asked about the composition of the board, we want it to be more general and just say, you know, we'd like to be able to provide that direction locally. I, I think I think that's a fair comment. Um, so, uh, so the wording then you're suggesting would be to uh, that the respective municipal council be given authority to appoint uh, or to determine the composition of its police services board. Is that what you're suggesting? That was the direction I thought the conversation went last week, and so I I wasn't sure this letter was representing it accurately, unless I I misunderstood. Um, let's have some other councillors weigh in. Deputy Mayor McIntosh and then Councillor Sherwood. Um, are we not worried about uh, political influence if we appointed all council? For example, um, that was discussed at length at the meeting. That that was the fear if we did that. So I think we need to be a little more specific. That that may be your fear. It certainly wasn't my fear. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> fear. I got um, that impression. And and and, and four other provinces in this country all uh, have their council members as members of the services board. So uh, yeah, I support that. Councillor Sherwood. I think, uh, yes, your worship, going um, where uh, Councillor Peters was heading, I think I was under the impression too that we were asking for council to decide, number one, how many members and how many members we want could be three councillors and four councillors and four members of the public. I'm just, I was under the impression that we were asking for control and um, I, I didn't think that I was saying that I wanted it to remain five, meaning two councillors and three members of the public. I still thought that that would have been a discussion that we would go forward as to the makeup of it, but that we wanted that control. Right. I know, uh, the current legislation sets down the number of members that uh, that one can have, and uh, municipality of our size is allowed to have five. And uh, so I don't know if if the legislation in 2022 is going to uh, give us the option of of selecting the number of members or not. But uh, um, I'd certainly like to leave it as open as possible, as Councillor Peters has suggested. Um, pass or post? Um, if I may, Mr. Mayor, perhaps the suggestion then is to change the wording to um, municipal council be given authority to appoint the required representation because then it's leaving it open to any required representation that is determined will be appointed by municipal council. That would be my suggestion to maybe appease what Councillor Peters is saying because I see where he's coming from with that comment. Yeah. I like that change. Councillor Peters, is that, uh, is that? That's along the line. And, yeah. and again, uh, to you to Deputy Mayor, um, I wasn't advocating for a certain board composition. I was advocating for the ability to discuss and potentially influence that board composition. Right. So. Okay. Very good. Um, Councillor Taylor. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I guess I was, uh, you know, kudos to you, Councillor Peters, for challenging us to be clear. I guess I was thinking that we had all said that, well, we didn't all say, uh, but we had generally thought that having a council or sorry, a committee for the police full of elected officials was not necessarily a wise thing to Deputy Mayor's point of influence. So in my mind, I guess I was thinking we would continue with two elected members and whether I was one of them or not is not relevant just two members of this committee of this council and then three that we would appoint and the difference is is that currently now it's two provincial appointees and one that we would appoint and and in addition to determining who would be on that that committee so to me it should be two elected officials and typically one of those elected officials is the mayor and then whomever council determines to be on it and um, then three delegates or designates from council is what I would think we would do. 
So if it's going to be written with five members of council, uh, I can't support that. I mean, right. I don't, I don't, I don't think it says that. And I like what Councillor Post is suggesting to um, leave uh, the wording uh, a little more vague. Um, I think this is going to be filled in once the new uh, act uh, is is dropped in front of us and um, presumably, you know, um, the decision is going to be made for us, unfortunately. So I I, I think, um, I, I don't know, I, Councillor Post, do you want to make a motion on that to change the wording as you had suggested and then we can vote on that? Yep, I would change it to say to appoint the required representation to the Police Services Board and I would move that motion forward. Okay, anybody wish to second that? I'll support that. Councillor Andrews, yep. any further comments before we vote on that recommended change? Councillor Taylor? With all due respect, I just think it's a little too broad and it gives the implication that we could have five elected officials on that board and I just can't support that. Okay. Um, well, again, I, Councillor Taylor, I, I appreciate what you're saying, but you know, the province is going to determine what the what the makeup is. Uh, it's it's highly. I mean, I, I made my my point in our meeting last week that I felt we are responsible for the fiscal management of the town, and that historically it, we haven't been as councillors. It's it's been. Uh, taken away from us and uh, I, I, I still strongly feel that we are capable of making decisions on our police force, uh, including the fiscal management of it. But oh. that being said, um, I don't think what Councillor Post is suggesting opens the door for, for 100% council representation. I don't, I, and I, I have no uh, inkling of a thought that that's what's going to happen. I mean, clearly, the, the province is going to be uh, mixing this uh, again, I think, with council and public representation. And, you know, but I would like to, I'd like to, to vote on Councillor Post's uh, recommended change. And if, if uh, you wish to vote against that, Councillor Taylor, so be it. <laughs> uh, go ahead, Councillor Taylor. If I may, just as clarification, um, I did send uh, a note to council describing the changes of section 31 versus section 10. And really there isn't financial decisions that are made by the police services board moving forward. So they're they're done by the OPP and just, I know you know that your worship, I just wanted to offer that clarification. So, so thank you. Very good. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor. Councilor Sherwood, did you wish to comment again? Uh, my only comment is this could be a decision that maybe the seven of us might not even be making. It might be a next a new council that's going to be making that decision. And if that new council decides they want all five councils, that's their decision. But if they want one council and four members of the public, I think that's going to be a discussion in the future. I think to have Councillor Post's wording just say that we have control over who those five are, whether they be all all politicians some politicians more politicians more people from the public i personally think the next council is going to be discussing that not us you may be right you may be right council show very good okay we have a motion now um all in favor of councillor post motion and opposed we have deputy mayor mcintosh and councillor taylor in opposition the motion carries Madam Clerk, can you make uh, the changes to that letter? And uh, um, do you need me to come and sign it? Or uh, we, <laughs> today's the seventh. Um, Madam Clerk. Yes. yes, I do, Mr. Mayor, so that we can send it off. Will, uh, we will drop by your office shortly. Thank you. All right, Council. Uh, let's go back to um, our agenda here. We have um, a motion uh, for bylaws. Uh, the bylaw to confirm the proceedings of tonight's meeting. Councillor Peters is making that motion. Seconded by Councillor Sherwood. All in favor? And we need a motion to adjourn. Councillor Post, second by Councillor Andrews. All in favor? All right, folks. Have a good evening. Thanks very much. Night all. Good night all. Good night all.